yeah, we're we're slowly climbing up with people viewing. So okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So hey, everyone. Uh, sorry about the whole stream fiasco. Um, welcome to the Music Business Club. Um, my name is Amanda Montgomery. I'm the president of the club, and today we have an amazing guest speaker. Um, <laughs> Well, but before that, I, we have a couple of other people also on the call. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves and then we'll get into George and yeah. Hey, what's up? I'm Vinayak Sharma and I'm the vice president of Music Business Club. Um, hi, my name is Amy Renzulli and I'm the secretary of the Music Business Club. Hi, my name is Pamela Santa and I do PR and marketing for Business Club. Awesome. Oh my God, I accidentally just opened Logic. Jeez. Um, so this week we have George Howard um, as our guest speaker. So George, if you want to introduce yourself and then we'll get right into discussing. Right on. This. Well, thank you so much for having me. And, and this was uh, not a snafu. In the scheme of snafus, this is a, a very, very minor snafu. So mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't sweat it. Um, I, I applaud you all in the time of uh, the quarantine to be putting things on like this and continuing to keep on keeping on. Um, you know, I deeply believe that, that art and music, just like uh, life and love, find a way. And we're all trying to find the way together. So you're you all are my heroes in the midst of all that you have going on to do something like this. So I'm, I'm so um, I'm honored to, 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 uh, to be here. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess this is being recorded too, probably, right? So people can yeah. can look at it. Yeah. So, um, and you wanted me to talk about kind of copyright music publishing, the, the gen you want me just to kind of ram a lamb on it or, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. All right. So, you, I mean, by way of background, I've, I've been in the music business for a long ass time. Um, started a record company when I was 19, a million years ago. Um, and ended up running some labels and, and um, starting some music business companies along the way, managing artists, um, currently a principal at a music licensing and publishing company. I did get my, my law degree and my MBA uh, along the way, but the most important job for me, aside from being a good dad, is, is, is teaching. And I've been a, a, a faculty member at Berkeley since uh, 2011. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's a real, I don't know, I don't know what I did in whatever past life to get so lucky about that. But um, happy to, uh, happy to talk about music publishing. I think it's, it's, it's probably, not probably, it is the most important. And, and, and I mean, I mean, I, like, I, I like it if people like interrupt me and ask questions uh -huh. and stuff. I mean, so if there are people that have questions either on here or on Twitter or wherever they are, or if you all have questions or if I'm not making any sense, just, just let me know. I'd, I'd rather have this be kind of conversational than, than a lecture, but, um, you know, whatever works for everybody. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, music publishing is one of those kind of dark arts um, that, that very, very few people understand um, in the music business, even even those that are in the music business, not, let, let alone like artists. Um, I'm constantly amazed at how few people at very high levels of, of the music industry are just like, I don't and um, I don't get that. Um, and it's it's increasingly, I mean, it's always been problematic. I mean, the, the music business has been, was founded on kind of information asymmetries and racism and making sure that the artists don't and can't understand contracts. And, and I hate that, right? I mean, it's it's fundamentally asymmetric power dynamics. And you know, it's just, it just, it's just horrible. And, it's, it's, um, and the artists get exploited and um, it's unethical. and, and I think as we've seen, you know, any 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 kind of unethical institution will eventually kind of crumble under its own weight. And in the music industry is it's hard to even really define what the music industry is today. I mean, I, it's so much more than than Spotify and, and the major labels. I mean, they they represent kind of what the, the you know average layperson or whatever thinks. But but for me, it, it's it's always been about the person that that just feels the urge and the need to create and um, gets the music out there. And, and I've, I've spent my life trying to untangle the mess that is is the, the kind of 
point in between that creator and the consumer. Um, there is a certain duty, I think, or burden on the artist to, to understand this. It's just not that hard. The information's out there. Um, and so it, it becomes increasingly inexcusable, I think, for artists to just be like, oh, I don't need to understand that. Um, I mean, do, do so at your own peril. Um, I, I, I don't believe that, that artists should, should be forced into being both the musician, the creator, and the business person. Excuse me. I think it's, um, it's impossible to do both great, right? You can be a great artist or a great business person. It's hard to be both of those at the same time just because of opportunity cost. But that doesn't mean that you have to sign to a label. Um, it, it does mean that you should consider finding someone who's really passionate about your work um, and, and wants to see you succeed, who's deeply interested in technology, law, you know, marketing, those types of things. And, and it's amazing what, what a, a two <laughs> motivated people can do when they put their minds to it. And, and that, that's, that'll take you a long way if you kind of take that approach. But in order to kind of break the rules, you need to know the rules. And, and the rules of the game with, with the music industry all stem from, from copyright and, and music publishing generally. I'll try to break this down in as, as kind of simple a way as I possibly can. I'll also, if you remind me, Amanda, um, I, did, I did write a book, a um, little handbook um, years ago when I was uh, working at TuneCore about kind of just fundamentals of music publishing. It, it needs to be updated, but it, it at least I think it, I think it distills things down better than a lot of, a lot of other ones. Great. Yeah. We can, well, I can share uh, that and you can post it. Yeah. yeah well, everything will, we'll link it below. <laughs> so I think, um, I think the, the, the best way to do this is, is probably through an example. Um, and, and I mean, I, th I think you had mentioned that, uh, that the, the example I gave in one of our classes resonated a little bit and it's one I use all the time and it's in the book, but, um, you know, when a song is, is created, um, it, it, as long as that song is, is original um, and, and fits the, the definition of, of a work, it has to be kind of long enough. It can't just be like a single note. And, and you have to sort of intend to create a song and it's an original song. Now, the, the line between what is original and what is not is, is not clear, right? Um, there have been a lot of recent, law, uh, a lot of cases about you know, where, where infringement occurs. The rule of thumb for artists is it, it, ha it, 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 can't, it can't materially resemble any other existing work. Now, where, where materiality is, is, I mean, that's tricky, right? So um, use your best judgment, right? Like, you'll know. You'll know if, I mean, if you're just ripping something off, right? I mean, if you're, if you're incorporating a, 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 a lyric or a melody or guitar parts or whatever, either by replaying them and certainly by sampling them, um, it's, it's not going to meet the threshold of originality. Um, you know, can you quote a lyric here or there? There are only 12 notes. So, so the line is, is, it can be a little bit tricky. Use your best judgment um, and, and strive for originality always. We'll, you know, make the work that's in your heart. Um, when when you create that original work of authorship and you you write it down or record it you're satisfying the copyright codes requirements for being granted copyright and, and that the writing down and the recording is called fixation right we're actually taking copyright is about the 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 um the the idea kind of expression dynamic you can't copyright an idea you copyright the expression of the idea so if i just kind of walk around my house and hum it's not copyrightable. If on the other hand, I write down a discernible melody or lyric and it can be, I could record it into my iPad or I could write down the tab or whatever, that's enough. And that's enough to be, to be granted um, the copyright to the work. Now, would you say that um, there have been times that people have been sued for copyright infringement and in your personal opinion, they were copying a groove? Or an idea, not well. Something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the most notable case on that was the the the, uh, the state of Marvin Gaye was is involved was involved in a lawsuit with um, with Robin Thicke and uh, and Pharrell Williams over a song called Blurred Lines, and um, it's still. I mean, I think it's about settled now. It, it went. 
they, what happened was, I won't get on all the vagaries of it, but um, long story short, uh, the, the state of, Robin, of, of Marvin Gaye thought that the song Blurred Lines was um, substantially similar to a Marvin Gaye song called Gotta Give It Up. And if you play the two back to back, and they're mashups right on YouTube, you can play. There's a feel, right? And, and even in the, in the trial, um, uh, I forget which one, one of them, Pharrell, the other said, yeah, we were trying to kind of get that Marvin Gaye vibe. And, and they did, you know. Um, the court found uh, that, that, that they, that uh, Pharrell and Rob Dick had infringed on, on the Marvin Gaye song. And they awarded, you know, I think it was originally $15 million in damages to the estate. That got knocked down um, and on appeal, but I think it's still I think it's still uh, on the books. I don't think it's been overturned. Um, and it's you know it's a kind of a punchline there. It's like where you can say that the, the line for copyright isn't isn't you know clear. It's blurred, right? You know, like the <laughs> song. Um, and uh, there was a recent case with Katy Perry where it it, it went in favor uh, went against Katy Perry where she was she was found um, to be infringing on another work, and that did get overturned. Which is good because you know in my in my experience, you know historically you, you can copyright melody and lyric. You can't copyright a vibe. You can't copyright a drum pattern. You can't copyright, and and you know, law is always this kind of balance of the rights of the individual with the rights of society, and so copyright is meant to give the creators a way to to have what's known as a limited duration monopoly, where for some period of time you can you and you alone can have the rights to reproduce and distribute and do these things with your work and then over time and in the united states it's, it's 70 years after the the death of the last living songwriter that work falls into what's known as the public domain anybody can use it so there's this balancing act similarly there's a balancing act of well we don't want to make it so odious that no one knows where the line is and people are afraid to write work right because they're afraid they're going to get sued that's known as a chilling effect in, in law, where it's like, we're so concerned about getting sued that we're gonna stop creating. You don't want that, right? So, so we're always trying to balance it. I think that the Robin Thicke case, certainly the Katy Perry case, there was a Led Zeppelin case recently, uh, which we found in favor of Led Zeppelin that they did not, uh, did not commit infringement. Um, all those cases were really, really erring on the side of going too far in causing songwriters to go, well, how can I, how can I write anything? Because everything, I mean, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. So how do I write anything without being sued? It seems like, particularly with this repeal, this overturning of the Katy Perry suit, that the pendulum has swung back a little bit, which is good. It's good for writers. Um, as I say, you, you kind of know. Um, there is a really famous case, the George Harrison case, uh, where he was uh, found, found to be infringing on uh, his song, My Sweet Lord was found to be infringing on a uh, chiffon song called He's So Fine. And that that set a precedent for what's known as unconscious copy, where you can be found uh, to be infringing on a song, even if you didn't intentionally do it, if you've had access to the song, so you can have this unconscious copy, which, you know, look, we all hear stuff, we regret it, and we're all musicians. So we've all had that moment where we're playing a song and it's like, ooh, that sounds a lot like, you know, and at that moment, the burden's on you to either change it enough or to go to the writer and, and you know, make a deal. So, for instance, Sam Smith, um, so the story goes, wrote that song, Stay With Me. And, and during the recording of the writing of it, he realized that it was essentially a ripoff of Tom Petty's Won't Back Down. And if you listen to those two songs, it, it is, you know, and he did, I think Petty posted like a blog post on it before he died about how, um, you know, Sam Smith came to him. He's like, All right, I didn't mean to do this, but I like the song. Can we make a deal? And, and they did. That's the right way to do it. Um, because, I mean, anybody that is a songwriter knows the amount of work and time and effort that goes into into these things. And, and, and you want to have your art protected and you can always give it away. You can always say, look, anybody wants to use it, use it. Right. There's there's any number of ways you can do it. But to be a little bit more prescriptive about things, um, the thing that I think is, is so essential for artists to understand is that, that any song that's created at, at inception, there are actually two copyrights for that, that song. So the example I always use is, is the song, I Will Always Love You by, by Whitney Houston. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm tired, by Dolly Parton. 
So back in the 70s, Dolly Parton writes this great song, I Will Always Love You. She actually released it. It was, I think it was originally released on, on a record, uh, it was a soundtrack uh, to a movie called The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, which make of that what you will. I believe Burt Reynolds was in it. Um, but it's a great song. And But it was out in the 70s, it did okay. And then, you know, 20 years later, uh, Whitney Houston, who signed to Arista Records, makes a, a recording of it in the music business, we call it a cover, right? Where, where they're doing a re-record of the song. Um, and it becomes this gargantuan hit. It was on it was on the soundtrack for a movie called The Bodyguard, and it just absolutely exploded. Um, so it's a good, it's a good example of kind of the interplay of the two rights. So I, maybe I'll just draw on my little whiteboard here. I also I, I posted to, for people to ask questions on Twitter too. I don't know if I can do it. I just should check. Oh yeah, here's a question actually. Uh, someone asked, could I talk about what, what Mood Agent is doing? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, but that's a good question, but I, I'd like to talk about just kind of music publishing generally. So let me see if I can do this. I think it might help if I just try to write on my board here. I'm a professor, I never go anywhere with my whiteboard. <laughs> Anyone that has questions, uh, feel free to write it, um, you know, in the uh, YouTube chat and we will get to it um, either at the everyone. end or if you know how it, so do you, my role at Riptide, um, I'm the chief uh, innovation officer at Riptide, um, but I just, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a, a, a rolling up my sleeves like everybody else, particularly in these times and trying to, um, trying to, uh, trying to do the best that, that we can for the artists who we have the privilege of representing and, and get their work out there in new and innovative ways. And uh, I feel lucky to be uh, part of the Riptide team. Um, okay, so, um, uh oh, someone just tweeted out that they say, make it work, I want in. So I guess the link's wrong. Let me, let me see. If I, on Twitter, I guess the link's wrong. Can you, how do we do this? Let's see. Yeah, I have the link that is currently working. Um, yeah, and I can, but I don't. I can just email that to you right now, real quick. Okay. Technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she also asks, Danielle also asks, what's the advice you have for artists currently trying to promote their music during this time? Yeah, what a great question, Danielle. So I just wrote a piece. Um, I guess I'll take this down until we get the thing going here. Um, so I just wrote a piece. Oh, here we go. All right. So let me, let me just, sorry. Let me just put this link out on my Twitter. Our guest speaker last week, Dan Cervantes, actually works with George Howard and our whole club meeting last week was about digital marketing during these unprecedented times. We spoke about GH Strategic, um, you know, which is George Howard's um, company. And so if you will link all that information as well, there's a remote musician's handbook that talks about specifically uh, digital marketing during these times. So. Uh, We'll link that and you can also reference there, Danielle. Um, it's a great question, Danielle, sorry. Uh, so, you know, I just wrote a piece about, um, for Forbes about um, rethinking music and the, the kind of as a job to be done. So job to be done is a, a framework that, that Clayton Christensen who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma cooked up um, in 2000 something. And it, it really became a, a very, a very, well, um, very, very you know, great strategy where you kind of think about how, why customers hire certain things, right? And, and for a job to be done. And so if you look at what's happened in, in COVID-19 era, um, music streaming has actually gone down. And, and uh, if you think about that, it's counterintuitive. You'd think, wow, well, I think music streaming would explode. It hasn't. And, and what's happened was, Think about the job to be done that, that people hire music for. Well, a lot of people hire music um, for a certain job of like commuting, like when you're driving and wherever you're going, we're not commuting anymore. A lot of people hire music to put their headphones on and, and while they're working in a cubicle, we're not doing that anymore. Instead, we're all stuck at home with other people and music has a different job to be done. Conversely, um, the rise in video games, like EA stock is up like crazy. Netflix is going crazy. Um, because it, it's a different job to be done. So I think, I, I don't have the answer. I, I, I do think that musicians should be thinking long and hard 
about about how they are going to what what role their music plays in this time. For me, it's 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 much more a job of healing, right? A much more job of kind of I mean, music soothes the savage beast, right? And and so like the the music that you make now needs to be filling a certain void in people's lives and heart in a different way than it was before. As I think now is a really optimal time for musicians to understand licensing around video games and, and other ways to get their music out there and heard. Netflix um, uses a shit ton of music in all their all their shows, um, understanding that licensing process. Um, we haven't yet, I'm, I'm kind of rattling this around in my brain, but I don't think that the answer is to just be like, okay, well here, tune into me while I play on my couch, right? Um, there's this, this, this um, kind of, term called skeuomorphic thinking, which is when you take something that's offline and put it online, right? And, and try to replicate that experience and it, it never works. And so now there are a lot of people that are kind of skeuomorphically going, well, I can't tour, I can't play at a, at a venue. So just watch me play on my couch. Well, nobody, nobody really wants to do that unless you're a super fan because you're missing that kind of ambient space that happens when you watch, not, not just kind of the magic, but that ambient space when you're in a club watching some band, think about that. Think about your habits there and your, your behavior. It's not, it, it's not a one-to-one -one or one-to-many thing. It's someone on the stage, hopefully creating something beautiful or evocative or whatever, and you're standing there typically with someone or with friends. And there's there's the ambient thing that happens. Like you, you know, if you're with like your significant other, you squeeze his or her arm and like at the moment or you, you know, and that doesn't, it's hard to replicate with you just kind of sitting there on a couch. And that's what, that's what people are missing. Um, video game, video gaming, again, kind of points a potential way forward because that's so digitally native, right? It's not video games avoided a lot of the skeuomorphism. Like you don't, you don't play monopoly on a video game the same way you do on a, on a, on, in real life. So video games, like they, they were really smart with Twitch to like have that kind of side scroll of people. And, and that's often as or more entertaining than, than what's going on in the screen. Music hasn't yet figured that out. Um, the closest I saw was uh, last Friday. I mean, what day is it? Yeah, tomorrow's a new one, hopefully. But last Friday, The Dead did, did a, a sh an old show from like they're doing a whole shakedown series on their YouTube channel. And um, they did like a little pregame thing and asked questions or whatever, but they... It, it wasn't, you know, the remaining dead members playing from the living room. It was just a badass show from like 1989 or something. And it became like an occasion. And for me, it served a really great job to be done. I just sat there and I felt the connectivity. And, you know, so I think you need to make it an occasion in the same way that, that going to a club might or might not be. It's a long answer to your question, Daniel. And I, I don't think I answered it, but maybe gave you some things to think about. I'd much rather do just Q and A. Like if there are questions coming in, that's way better than than me prattling. But uh, uh, I don't know if there are no questions, I'll prattle. Um, but just interrupt me. So all right. So on to publishing. Let's see. Oh, that's the wrong button. All right. So if we think about the song, can you all see that? Right. So you think about a song, um, and again, I talked about like there's, it has to be original. You need to write it down and record it. That gets you copyright. The reason that you register, and you should register your work with, with the copyright office is because unless and until you do, you can't sue for infringement, right? You have the copyright, but you can't protect it until you register that work. So if I write a song 10 years ago or something and, and Amanda heard it and she, she sampled it um, and stuck it up in, in her song with my sample and it became a big hit, and I didn't notice it um, until five years later. Um, and then I go, well, I'm gonna sue you. The judge is gonna say, well, did you register your copyright? And I'm gonna say, no, and they say, well, you can't, right? And I say, well, I'll register it now. And then, then you can register, but then I can only sue Amanda from the time of registration. I can't go back those five years and sue for all the past infringement time. So it's, it's really good practice to, um, to register your works when you make them. Uh, one of my other employees did a, a, a book on how to bulk register copyrights. So I can try to find that and give that to you too, because it, you know, I think registration is either 35 or 50 bucks a copyright now, but if you, if you're the sole writer of the work um, and you register at the same time, you can register a whole, it's not registering the sound recording, it's not registering collection. You're actually registering the, the, the composition. 
but you can do that in bulk. So I, I can give you the resource on that as well. But so in any case, so you write a song, um, the song has, has two, two kinds of copyrights. And I always denote them this way. The C is copyright for composition. I should flip my thing around. George, I just noticed that on the live stream, you can't see the whiteboard. Oh, that sucks. All right, well then I'll just talk it through because that's no point. I can see it on the live stream. Oh, all right. I don't know. You all tell me what to do. But yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's about a 20 second lag, but it's oh, there's a delay. Yeah, there's a yeah. delay yeah, to, to bleep out when I curse. All right. So let me let me have, have rejiggered here. All right. So you got a song. And then you have on one side, you've got the C, which is for the composition. And I know my, my handwriting is like what you see on the inside of a prison cell. But me. And then um, the other side is 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 the phonogram. And that's for the sound recording. And the C side is owned or controlled by the songwriter or the publisher, right? And the P side is owned or controlled by the label or the performer. So if we think about I Will Always Love You, you'd have Dolly over here. And then when Whitney did her version, you'd have Whitney and Arista Records, right? And one important thing to know is that unless and until you assign your copyright for your song to a publisher, you are your own publisher. So don't let anybody tell you that, that you know, you don't, you don't have a publisher or whatever. Yeah, you do, you. And unless and until you do a publishing deal with someone, you, you are the sole publisher. And, um, you know, I don't know how long we want to go or how much time, and I got a bunch of crap I got to do too. But um, I can get into like publishing agreements and stuff if you want, if people care. But um, okay, so, you write these songs and, and then immediately, as soon as you write that original work of authorship, you get a bundle of rights and you have exclusive rights and you have the exclusive right of distribution, reproduction, display, derivatives, public performance, I'm dyslexic, so you'll forgive me. Public performance and then um, digital public performance. All right, and then so I write, Dolly writes, I will always love you. She, as the songwriter, has the exclusive right of distribution. Arista Records signs Whitney Houston and makes a new version of that song they have the right of distribution for the sound recording, even while Dolly keeps the right of distribution for the composition. Same deal with reproduction, right? So these two together, distribution and reproduction, that's selling, right? That's essentially selling a recording, whether that's on a, on a, a CD, vinyl, a download, a stream, reproduction and distribution and the term of art for reproduction and distribution of a C onto a P is a mechanical license, right? And that's one of those terms that, that everybody in the music industry hears. I think oftentimes they don't know what it means, but it, it's the license between the record label and the, and the, and the writer of the song, right? So Arista Records does not own the song I Will Always Love You. Dolly and her publisher do. If Arista Records reproduces and distributes that C, that C on their P without a license in place, they're going to get sued for infringement, right? So to avoid that, they, they enter into a, a mechanical license deal that stipulates that I, Dolly, agree to let Whitney re-record my song and have it be reproduced and distributed by Arista Records. And in exchange, 
heirs to records will pay me, Dolly, a mechanical royalty. Now, for, for physical and for digital downloads, that mechanical royalty is 9.1 cents per reproduction, which is, which is an atrocity. That is, the, that is the rate that your legislative body, your senators, your representatives have agreed in, in, on, and they have capped it. Dolly cannot charge any more than that. And by the way, um, that rate has not gone up since 2003. Inflation's gone up. Everything else has gone up. Songwriters are still getting paid for the reproduction and distribution at the same rate as they were in 2003. There should be blood in the streets, right? There isn't. So there's also the right of display. Display for the, for the composition is going to be things like sheet music, um, lyrics, any of those things. Um, display on the sound recording would be album art and any of the packaging. Oftentimes the label doesn't own that, they license that in from, from photographers or whatever, but they do have the, 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 the copyright for the display of the, of the recording. Derivatives are, are more commonly known as, as samples. So a derivative work is, is a work that is, as the name implies, derived from an existing work. So originally derivatives were things like translations um, theatrical reproductions of, you know, if I made a movie based on a song. In the, in the late 80s and early 90s, people started sampling and there, there was no easy category to fit, uh, fit what was happening in. Over time it emerged, they said, okay, well, what that is, if you pull 15 seconds of satisfaction from a Rolling Stones record, you're in essence creating a new work, you're deriving a new work from an existing work and then you have to, you, the new work creator, have to get a license from both the, the publisher, the copyright holder of the song, and also from the label who has the copyright for the sound recording. So if I just play the riff for satisfaction and put it in the song, I would have to get the, the derivative license from the Rolling Stones publisher, but I would not have to get it from Abco Records or whoever had, holds the copyright to the sound recording. If, however, I pull from whatever record that's on, then I would have to get the license from both the, the publisher and the label because they both have the right of distribution. Um, things go off the rails in the, in the United States because we do have a right of public performance in the composition, but there is not a right of public performance in the sound recording. And let me talk that through. So, Public performance is any, any broadcast, whether it's live or recorded or whatever, in, in, a not, in, a, in a place that is not dominantly family members, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial place. But so if I listen to the radio in my house, I don't have to pay a public performance license. The, the station that's airing that radio, that song pays a public performance license. If I, if I sit in my house and play Bob Dylan songs on my guitar, I don't pay a public performance license. However, if I started having people over and charging them over time, um, there would in fact be uh, the knock on the door from the ASCAP or BMI police saying, look, you need a, 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 a license from us. This is really tricky but I need everybody to understand it because it's the most important royalty that's out there because it's so pervasive. So let, let's go back to the analogy here. I will always love you. Dolly writes the song. Whitney records it. It gets played on the radio nonstop, Whitney's version. So you roll back time to the 90s or whenever that song was a hit for, for, for Whitney. It was literally on the radio all the time. In order for the radio stations and, and Whitney and Arista not to be sued, Dolly had to agree to give them a license for public performance. The radio stations, Whitney, uh, Dolly, et cetera. Sorry, Whitney, et cetera. That doesn't scale well, right? Um, Dolly can't run around to every radio station that might play her record and, and negotiate a rate um, for that public performance. So back in the 1930s, the, the PROs, ASCAP and BMI emerged, and their job is to sign up songwriters, 
and then negotiate licenses on behalf of those songwriters with anyone who wants to broadcast music. So I'm ASCAP. I go to the radio stations and I say, hey, if you want to play all of the songs that are in our catalog, you can, but you have to pay us this blanket license fee. ASCAP collects that blanket license fee, takes their VIG off the top, which is unconscionable, and then based on some formulas only known to ASCAP, pays out in theory to the writers, right? The same license is required for, for digital broadcast too. So Spotify has to pay the same thing, pay, pay a license too. Um, all the DSPs do, um, all of the, um, all of the, any of the, the web radios, venues have to pay it, um, restaurants, any place that, that is broadcasting music has to pay it. So it's a gargantuan revenue stream. The problem with it is, is that it's really, really inefficient. You essentially have this, this duopoly. You've got ASCAP and BMI. They control the market. To my mind, they are morally bankrupt. They, they are not putting the interests of their songwriters ahead of their own. They, they do not accurately report. And I should be clear. I know lots of people that work at these PRs and they're wonderful people. Um, it's often not the people at the institutions that are unethical. It's the institutions themselves that are unethical. And that, that's obviously problematic. But, um, but it, it's, it's, it's a huge material revenue stream for songwriters and most people don't understand it. ASCAP and BMI are not publishers. They, they represent one very specific right, the right of public performance um, when those songs are broadcast. Now, as I said, there's an X here because in every other industrialized country, except for the United States, North Korea, Iraq, and Syria, the performers also get a right of public performance. The states doesn't grant that. And that's caused all sorts of problems. So back to my example. Dolly writes, I will always love you. Whitney play, Whitney's records it, gets played on the radio nonstop. Dolly gets paid. Whitney and, and Arista do not, right? Not a dime for any type of terrestrial radio play. Um, so Dolly's happy as a clam. And uh, the others, the other, you know, Whitney and Arista don't make a dime. Rest of the world, both Dolly gets paid, the, the, the label gets paid, and the performer does, right? This is a concept known as neighboring rights, and we don't have neighboring rights here in the States. There are ways in which uh, US recording artists can get their neighboring rights. If you are, for instance, if you are a songwriter who releases your songs on your own label, um, you are automatically qualified for neighboring rights. Collecting them can be a drag. Um, if you are signed to a label, the label is gonna collect them. And unless you record your works outside of the States, you won't get your neighboring rights as a performer. It's why you see like Beyonce and big artists going to Canada or France or whatever um, to uh, to go and uh, to go and, and and record their music so they can get the the performer share of neighboring rights, which can which can be huge. Um, in order to kind of remedy this, the 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 Digital Millennium Copyright Act and other acts put in this right of digital public performance. And that, oops, that accrues to the, the sound recording. And this is, so now if you are a sound, if you are a sound recording holder, you're a label or you're a performer, you can collect public performance, but only through digital transmissions. There are two different types of digital transmission. There's non-interactive digital streams, which would be something like Spotify. That's a negotiated rate. Where, where you as the, as the rights holder of the label go to Spotify and negotiate that rate, it's tiny, it's fractional. And then there's, there's the interactive, uh, um, I'm sorry, non-interactive streaming services would be like the Pandora's of the world where you, you don't, I think I screwed up. Spotify is interactive, Pandora, the others are non-interactive. So Pandora, the money is collected by an organization called Sound Exchange and they pay out to the, the labels and, and the songwriters. So if you're a songwriter, so in, the, in my scenario here, when, when, when Dolly's song, I Will Always Love You, gets played on terrestrial radio, Dolly gets paid, Whitney doesn't. When it gets streamed on Pandora, Dolly still gets paid a public performance via ASCAP and BMI, but now 
Whitney's estate gets paid via sound exchange and Arista Records gets paid via sound exchange. When it gets played on an interactive streaming service like a, um, like a Spotify, they're also getting paid, but it's a negotiated rate. I know that's a ton of information. I, I don't know how to simplify it better than that, but those are, those are the six rights that you, you've got to know as a songwriter. A student asked um, who in ASCAP or BMI determines the calculation of distributing the royalties and why is it so um, non-transparent? It's non-transparent because it benefits them to be non-transparent, right? Anytime, anytime a system is non-transparent, you can guarantee that they're keeping it non-transparent because they don't want it to be transparent because they're not doing the right thing, right? And so, yeah, they will not, they will not be, you know, tell us what their formulas are. They will not make clear how they're paying, who they're paying. They continue to, uh, they continue to, they continue to um, work on a modeling, not measuring basis, even when they could precisely determine what, what songs are being played where and paid directly to writers. And it's because as long as they keep it opaque and, and in the dark, they can graft off however much they want and chalk it up to, you know, kind of administrative fees. So there needs to be more of these. The good news is, you know, CSAC's out there now, Azoff has his, as more of these emerge, this kind of duopoly will have to become more transparent, but, but it, it just sucks right now. And it, 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 it's terrible for the artists because they don't have any recourse. Where are you going to go? Right. I mean, you got to sign up to one of them or you don't get anything. But it's uh, it, it, more artists need to be vocal about their displeasure. And for me, you know, at Berkeley, like so few artists are affiliated with PRS. I don't know. I, I hope that, that through some of these disruptive times, we'll see more innovation. And one of the things that really needs to be fixed is, is the, the performance rights uh, societies. They're just a mess globally. I mean, I've, I've prattled on for years now about how blockchain might address it. And there are there are there is light on that. I mean, one of the uh, friend of mine um, has a blockchain company and. He just did a, a, a proof of concept with, uh, with one of the societies overseas and is able to pay writers in two hours from recording versus the six months to a year to sometimes 18 months that it takes them to pay. So it'll change. It's just we may not be alive before it changes. You also have a book on blockchain, don't you, George? Yes, I do. Uh, it's called Everything in Its Right Place. Thanks for the prompt. Um, and it's really just sort of a travel log of my writing for Forbes and other places for Forbes. Um, and interviews with some badass people like Zoe Keating and, and various other artists, Ryan Leslie, about this kind of innovation in the music business. But, you know, I mean, blockchain, like any other technology, moves and fits and starts. Um, we are seeing some traction. I'm working on a project now for Berkeley called Radar, which is a blockchain-based um, uh, database of Berkeley student works um, that, that are controlled compositions where, where you own both the C and the P. And we're, we're going out to film schools and, and offering film students the ability to license these works into their projects, which I, I think, you know, why not? And then I want to move into video games and, and others and fuck it, maybe we'll start our own PRO. Um, a couple of questions coming in on the chat on YouTube. Uh, someone asked, uh, what about royalties from social networks such as Facebook or TikTok? Who collects those royalties? Such a great question. So again, there, there, there are two different types of royalties that are going on. I mean, Facebook just, they're just like, and be careful what their, their gambit now, and I don't know if they're still doing it, maybe someone talked them out of it, but um, they were going to, and may still be, trying to do buyouts for work. So they'd say, hey, artist, for $2,000, we'll give you $2,000 for your song. And then they own it. They own, they own the publishing. It's just a buyout here. Now Facebook's the author. Don't do that. Netflix has been trying to do that. Um, one of the other big networks was trying to do that. Discovery, the Discovery Network was trying to do it. Do not do that, right? So one thing that I should talk about, well, let me answer that question. So again, like TikTok um, or Facebook, if your songs are... And Facebook, it's really actually very hard to get music onto Facebook, right? They, they, they make it challenging because they don't want to get sued. TikTok's an infringement machine. TikTok exists because um, the labels and publishers at the beginning couldn't sue them because they were in China. Then it got so much momentum going and started throwing people from TikTok to Spotify. The labels were like, hell yeah, right? Because the label, the majors are making a million dollars an hour from, from Spotify and the other DSPs. So the labels couldn't do anything in the publishers at first because they couldn't find them. 
then they realized it was just a windfall for them because all these people were discovering music on TikTok in little snippets and then going to Spotify to listen to them. Now they're trying to normalize it. And TikTok's like, yeah, no, we don't want to pay it. They're like, oh, we're going to see. It's not, nobody's going to sue anybody. They're going to negotiate. And, and eventually, you know, you'll get some fractional public performance. Um, but, the, you know, the royalties are paid just as I mapped out there. There's, there's reproduction and distribution. Um, and there's public performance. Who collects that? Well, that's the role of publishers on one side. It's the role of labels. But you, you know, you can do this stuff yourself, or as I said, with with a uh, with a, a really savvy manager, and and that's that's the best way to do it. Um, but uh, are there other questions, or should I talk about like publishing deals? Um, there is one more. So. Um... Chris writes, hi, George, on the topic of PROs, <laughs> a problem that comes up for a lot of smaller venues like bars, restaurants, breweries is that they can't afford the licenses from BMI or ASCAP. And so because of that, they decide that doing live music is just too much of a pain. Uh, Isn't, it's just criminal, right? Like, I mean, it's it's just, I mean, I, I, I used to represent this awesome company that was using um, music to treat Alzheimer's and, and, you know, just like nothing but good nothing but good like music is medicine and the motherfucking PROs would not would not issue licenses to these senior living care centers because they couldn't figure out how so then the senior living care centers are like well as great as this therapy is and as much as it's working and there are no side effects and everybody loves it we can't risk getting sued and it's like are you kidding me so yeah, ask, that's exactly what I mean. Like if, if they would move to a, a measuring, not modeling system, you would go to a bar, you'd be like, well, look, you, you, yes, let's issue you a license so that you can play music so the songwriters can get paid and, and you can have music there and, and pay fairly, right? Um, instead, they model it. They're like, well, you're this size, you're this, so it's going to be this much. And all that fucking money is going to Chris Martin anyway, who doesn't need it, right? It's like, it, because it's not... It's not distributed in the right way. Um, it's a broken system and it's, it's unconscionable and it, it's, art is suffering because of it. So I, yeah, Chris, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you, but it just sucks. And then to your point, then band or bars or wherever, yeah, okay, so no music. It's the same thing with radio, right? Like radio, if, if, if pushed, radio will say, okay, you want us to pay a public performance right to the sound recording, we're gonna go to all talk right? We've got to find equilibrium. We've got to find free market pricing. And we can't when you've got the government coming in there and setting rates of consent decrees, and you've got a duopoly that controls the market that, that says, well, we're going to charge kind of whatever we want and make it unauditable. It's, it's tragic. Like art is dying because of it. Yeah. Um, what, of yeah. One other question is, um, and platforms, uh, someone asked, uh, do platforms like TuneCore help artists and composers if their music is used there on social networks? Like how does TuneCore kind of- Yeah, I mean, TuneCore, look, I, I left TuneCore before they really got into the whole publishing thing, but um, they have a publishing administration company. I, I can't vouch for them one way or the other, right? I mean, it, maybe it's a good segue into 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 publishing administration. I, I don't know how much time, I mean, I'm, I can go on forever. I shouldn't, I got shit to do, but like, what, what do you want me to talk about? Yeah, I mean, we did start a little late. So if you wanted to just, I, it is, eight o'clock now but if we wanted to speak for another 10 15 we would really appreciate it and then all right let me let me talk about this because i think it's really important so um uh let me try to move my little whiteboard up here again so all right so like let me let me try to map through a publishing deal yeah another student just asked um advice for songwriters that are um or things that they should look out for when they begin pitching their songs to labels and publishing. Ah. So it's perfect for. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, here's the thing to look out for. Right. All right. So let me, let me see. This is hard to kind of articulate. All right. Um, first off, like if you're a songwriter, you're not, you're, you're pitching, you're pitching yourself. You're pitching yourself to be signed as a performer, an exclusive performer as a song to a label as a songwriter, you pitch publishers, right? So you need to get that distinction. You gotta get that C and the P thing down. All right, so publishing deals. Um, the, the, the old school publishing deal is songwriter assigns X percent of her copyright 
to a publisher. All right. And the way, it, the way it'll work is like in a, in a typical publishing deal, you have what's known as the writer share and the publisher share. Um, so I'm a songwriter. And so in a publishing deal, I'm going to keep, um, I'm going to keep, how do I want to do this? Publishing deal, I'll keep 100% of my writer share. And then I will have none, and then the publisher gets 100% of the publisher share, right? So $100, so a song gets played and, and ASCAP collects $100, right? So ASCAP collects $100 from some radio station that's owed for this song. $100 comes in. ASCAP's going to take that and send $50 to the writer directly for the writer's share and $50 to the publisher. And the publisher keeps that. That's a typical publishing deal where you're essentially dividing the money up half and half. Same deal if there was money coming in from like upfront money. So if you if you got your music used in a TV show, the publisher would say, okay, they gave us $10,000 on the publishing side. You writer, you keep 5,000 of it. We publisher will keep 5,000. On mechanicals collected, They're, they might split it that way. What have you, right? Most artists aren't doing these types of deals anymore. This is a pretty old school kind of publishing deal. What you get instead these days are what's known as co-publishing deals. And in this case, what happens is the writer will keep on the writer share, the writer will keep 100% of the writer share. And then they set up a publishing company in their own name and they keep the, the publisher will take 50% of the publisher share and then 50% of the writer of the publisher share goes over to the writer. So the writer ends up with 150%, which if you do the math is 75% of 100. Um, of, 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 so with $100 that would come in here, right? Same example, $100 comes in in a publishing deal, the publisher would keep 50, the writer would keep 50. In a co-publishing deal, the $50 comes in to, to the, the publisher. They take 25 of that for themselves and they send 25 of it over to the writer for the writer's portion of the publisher share. And the writer keeps 50, all of the writer's share. So they end up with $75. So that's the difference between, and the, and the, and the, and the publisher keeps 25. So if you're a songwriter, it is very much in your interest to set up yourself as a, as a publisher. And as I said before, you are already a publisher. And then you go out to publishers and you say, okay, look, I wanna do a co-pub deal, which means that you're gonna keep 50% of the publisher share because you are a publisher too, and 100% of the writer share. On the question that somebody asked, you go out and, and I see this a lot and it's, it's the scariest thing in the world to me. Not the scariest thing in the world, but it's a scary thing. Um, I see songwriters, I see it a lot at Berkeley. You get these, these, these um, miscreants, these people who are, are bad actors, and they, they want, they say, I'm gonna, get your, I'm gonna get your song in a movie or TV, and all you have to do is sign your song over to me. And what they're looking for you to do is to sign both the writer's share and the publisher's share. Never do that, right? So if you're writing, if you're writing music for film or TV, you must, must keep 100% of your writer's share. So like I've represented uh, like Mark Isham. Mark Isham's this great composer. He does, he does Black Mirror, Once Upon a Time, River Runs Through, right? So if someone comes to him and says, hey, Mark, I want you to write, um, I want you to write some music for this TV show. He will say, great. And you, you Netflix or you ABC or you commercial or whatever, he wrote the Be All You Can Be song for the army. You, you all, I will give you the song. You will now be the owner of that song, the sound recording, and you will be, um, you know, but I, Mark, will keep my writer's share of the public performance money. So 
the song gets played on TV as a theme song, a million dollars comes in, right? Of that million dollars from the, from the PROs, Mark is going to get 500000 right to him as the writer's share, right? The, the production company as the publisher share is going to get their 500000 too. But what I'm seeing increasingly is companies going, no, 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 we'll pay you an upfront fee. We'll pay you $1,000, but then you give us both the writer's share and the publisher share. Don't do it. That's what, that's what um, uh, uh, Discovery Network was trying to do. It's what YouTube's trying to uh, Sorry, Netflix, Facebook are trying to do. We must, as artists, fight against that. If they do that, it's game over because one of the only revenue streams that, that can actually be really lucrative is holding on to that writer's share of public performance. So if you don't take anything away from my prattle tonight, take that away. And if you're confused about it, send questions to Amanda, to anybody, and, and I'll, I'll keep trying to, not now, I'll try to answer it, try to answer it, you know, not when I'm beat up after a day that started at 4.30 in the morning, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so, so much for speaking to our club members. Um, we'll have, you know, we've kind of discussed a, a lot of things and, um, you know, the your book and all of, you know, your socials and our socials kind of in the description. So if anyone does have questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out to the Berkeley Music Business Club and we'll relay uh, anything to George and hopefully. Yeah, just hit me up. I'm easily findable. I mean, it's not like, you know, you can find me. Um, you know, just hit me up on Twitter or whatever. You can find my emails, easy to find. And, and I mean, I think in this, this time now more than ever, like it's, it's purpose, not product, right? And, and, and uh, to, to one of the earlier questions about like, you know, strategies now, for so many artists, their, their, their revenue just got cut massively. You can't gig, you can't, you know, it's just, I don't know. My greatest fear is that we're going to come out the other side of this thing and they're going to be less artists, you know, and that's just, I can't live with that. So we have to bind together as people that, that this, this stuff means the world and, and help each other and help educate each other. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not the best, you know, I mean, there are lots of people a lot better than I, but I can get the conversation started and, and I'll, what I will do is I'll, I'll just keep at it. Right. Like I'm not going away. So um, hit me up with questions. I think it's it's so important and I'm so just redoubled my commitment to to people that are making music out there. Like we, we, we've got to fight this fight. The, the job to be done of music is, is bigger than it's ever been and more important. And we've got to figure out a way to make it sustainable for artists, not just for the artist's sake, but for all the people that rely on music to keep them sane, you know, especially through these times. So I, lo I love you all for doing this and, and finding the wherewithal to do it when you're, you know, just trying to hang in there through this, this coronavirus. So you let me know what I can do and I'll, I'll always, I'll always make time for it. Okay. Well, thank um, you so much. Thank you. And another thing I'd like to add for our business club members out there, you can also use us as a resource. We are also students and musicians struggling through the same thing that you are. So if you guys, need someone to talk to, just questions, music recommendations, book recommendations, anything Berkeley related or not, just message us on Berkeley Music Business Club on Instagram, or you can also email us at berkeleymusicbusinessclub at gmail.com. You know, this is, this is how it starts, right? Movements always start with, the, the, and innovation always starts with the people that are closest to the customer. And, and, you know, in times when there's really nothing left to lose, that's when innovation emerges. And, and, I hope that during this time, artists use it as a time to know that, that, that everybody's rooting for everybody. So try things, you know, try get the right tone and, and, and do it with a, with a good heart, but try things. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you all. For Thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Okay. George. Yeah.